So now we're going to go on with the Thorlaksen lecture. Um, so this year I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, um, uh, introduce Dr. Van Veen. Uh, she trained as a health scientist at the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Uh, she graduated in 2002 and uh, she then followed with an appointment as a policy advisor for quality and care innovation at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. In uh, 2010, she became the project manager uh, of a nationwide benchmarking collaborative of the operating room departments of all eight university medical centers in the Netherlands. And then she obtained her PhD in 2016 with a thesis describing uh, the work that she did for that uh, collaborative. And she'll present on that work here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Kaiser for inviting me from the Netherlands. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kaiser and Charity for organizing this well, well organized 40 hour trip to Winnipeg. Uh, it has been very interesting to learn from your OR department and to meet everyone. Uh, and it was also impressive. Uh, we had a tour at the Human Rights Museum. And it was fun, so thank you for that <laughs> very much. Uh, for now, I would like to ask you to please uh, pick out, uh, to uh, turn on your mobile phones and go to the internet. And then go to menti.com. Over here you can see the Wi-Fi uh, information if you need it. But go to menti.com and your experience with benchmarking. I'll just have to watch the answers. Okay, a lot of don't knows. <laughs> okay, well, I think we get the picture here. Well, I hope uh, there a lot of people uh, do have experience, and I hope to add a little bit of information to that today. Yeah, you can switch it off. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you for answering these first quiz questions. Well, to start off, I just want to compare, uh, but it's really quick and dirty, uh, the health system in Canada to the Netherlands, just to give you some uh, idea of uh, the system in the Netherlands. Well, healthcare expenditures in Canada are comparable to those in in Holland, it's about 10% of the gross domestic pro uh, product. The Dutch healthcare system is a different uh, organized from Canada's. Canada relies on a tax funded monopoly government insurer. The Dutch system provides universal coverage in, a un in an insurance premium funded system characterized by competition between private insurers and regulated competition between providers alongside a personal mandatory financial responsibility for patients. The government is more at the background uh, than here in Canada, however, still playing an important role in terms of regulation and oversight. Compared to the Netherlands, Canada has higher ratios of nurses and CT scanners to population, but the Dutch health healthcare system has higher ratios of physicians, MRI machines, and hospital beds to population. The Dutch have more beds, however, they are getting out of bed earlier since the average length of, of hospital stays is 5.2 days in 2017 compared to Canada with seven days. The Dutch experience shorter wait, time, wait times for emergency care, primary care, specialist care and elective surgery than do the Canadians. Looking at factors such as the healthcare system's ability to, to successfully manage and treat chronic and critical illness, illnesses and provide protection from medically, medically avoidable mortality, it seems the Dutch system broadly performs at a level similar to that in Canada. Life expectancy at birth in Canada is about, is about 80, 81.7 uh, years, so it's almost 82 years, and in the Netherlands it's exactly the same. Compared to, life, uh, compared to life expectancy at birth across OECD countries, being on average 80 years. Well, now on to the operating room department. <laughs> among, among the hospitals participating in my study, uh, approximately 60% of admitted patients receive operative surgical care. 
The operating room is a shared capacity dealing with shared resources and a ver variety of physicians and other professionals. This is complex and extremely challenging in the everyday business of a hospital. About 40% of revenues and, and expenses in a hospital are related to operative surgical care, emphasizing the importance of economic and operational efficiency. Optimal scheduling of operating rooms is one way to achieve effective and efficient use of their capacity. Benchmarking appears to be a useful instrument in enabling hospitals to learn from each other uh, and, and, uh, and to spread quality improvement. I would like to share my experiences, experiences with you today. Now, I am not an OR nurse, I am not a doctor, but I am married to a surgeon, surgeon so I hope that also counts. Well, no kidding, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I did immerse myself in the OR data of eight Dutch university medical centers for several years. The lessons we have learned from this in the Netherlands, I'm happy to be sharing with you today. Well, first lesson. <laughs> to avoid this reaction when entering the OR, do not just follow the trends in health man healthcare management, but know your data and the stories behind the data. Uh, to really engage physicians and healthcare professionals instead of just playing with the next management tool. Benchmarking the OR performance in Dutch uh, university hospitals resulted in improved OR scheduling, a reduction of case cancellations, a reduction of first case tardiness, and improved utilization of limited OR time. How did we accomplish this? Well, in 2004, the head of the OR department, a surgeon at that time, of the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, together with his OR business manager, were curious to know how well the OR department was performing. Lots of details of surgical cases and operating room time data is registered every day. However, we do not know how well we are performing. We do not have a reference. They wondered, why are we not able to compare our performance with other university hospital OR departments? So that is when it all, all started. And the surgeon and the manager together initiated a field trip and visited every university hospital in the Netherlands to ask the board of directors, as well as OR management, if they were also interested in comparing their performance. They were, and every Dutch university hospital was interested. And so it happened. The Netherlands, Netherlands have uh, 66 general hospitals, 22 categorical or spe specialized hospitals, and eight university hospitals. In these university hospitals, physicians work as salaried employees. So all university hospitals participated in this collaborative, and participation is voluntary. There's no competition between part participants. As you can see, they cover uh, whole, uh, of whole net the whole country. Uh, all participating hospitals have sufficient similarities in strategy, uh, structure, patient case mix, and their responsibility for tertiary care, clinical research, education, and innovation, which enables a fair comparison. These participants also share the same interest in current issues regarding their OR departments. Uh, so participation was not mandated by, mandated by a government, it was purely voluntary. The number of participants has remained unchanged since, since the start of this collaboration, so we're still covering uh, the whole of Netherlands. Um, the hospitals desired that all benchmarking actions were focused on collaboration, knowledge sharing, learning and improving. The par there was a partnership, uh, it, it was signed by the chairman of the board of every university hospital, and described the, it described the purposes of benchmarking at the start of the collaborative to compare the utilization of OR resources, identify performance gaps, and learn from similar hospitals with the aim to improve this performance and the overall quality of the OR process. To, to avoid comparing apples to oranges, uh, so therefore not only data and numbers are shared, but also information and knowledge about underlying organizational characteristics and how the OR is managed. So a considerable amount of time and effort was undertaken to develop this partnership agreement uh, during the initial phase. I think it took about a year. Uh, the signed agreement created the foundation of trust between the eight hospitals. Confidentiality and ownership of benchmarking data uh, are, are two delicate and important parts of this agreement. 
Well, since reforms in the Dutch healthcare system, vertical ranking, which is another type of benchmarking, is increasingly ap applied in order to provide hospital performance information to the public, to the people, and to support patients to make a well-considered choice for a hospital. However, these rankings generally tend to compare apples to oranges and do not provide the story behind the numbers. In the Netherlands, one magazine, Elsevier, and one daily newspaper, het Algemeen Dagblad, present a yearly hospital top 100. In other countries, there are also plenty of examples of non-scientific press rankings. Elsevier bases this ranking on expert opinion from doctors, nurses, quality managers and board members who are asked what they consider poor and good performing hospitals in their speciality. Het Algemeen Dagblad bases its ranking on quality indica indicators from the healthcare inspectorate combined with patient satisfaction measurements. Well, both claim to present quality of care information, but Dutch researchers assess the construct validity by testing the consistency between these two newspapers. Uh, and they, they did so by ranking the computing, by computing the correlation coefficients. Well, they found there was only a minor co correlation between both rankings, which makes it unlikely that these kind of rank rankings represent the quality of a hospital. Uh, you can see here with the, the cloud, it's really spread. And very unlikely that this will initiate quality improvement actions in these hospitals. That is why the Dutch OR Benchmarking Collaborative formulated a specific definition of their benchmarking actions. Important is to avoid comparing apples to oranges and to explore the story behind the numbers, carried out voluntarily and collaboratively by similar organizations in a safe learning environment. No rankings, no naming and shaming. Learning with and from others as principal aim. Exploring the story behind the numbers means networking and getting to know each other and visit each other's OR departments. Well, uh, you cannot read this, but it's not uh, necessary. Uh, benchmarking re requires comparable indicator information and reliable data gathering and sharing. It took the participants one year to develop and harmonize data definitions, uniform methods of data registration, and definitions of performance indicators, indicators among all participants. Every university hospital registers details of every surgical case and our time periods. For example, as you can see here, uh, time, the time the patient arrives at the OR, the start time of anesthesia induction, start time of first incision, etc. You all know. These data are prospectively and continuously measured and registered electronically, electronically by the nursing staff in each hospital information system and validated by the responsible surgeon and anesthesiologist. As I understood, in Canada, you use one and the same system to uh, register this data. In, uh, in, the, host in the Netherlands, uh, the system can vary. It's uh, either EPIC or uh, Chipsoft uh, HICS. Uh, sorry, yep. So longitudinal data collection within the OR benchmarking collaborative started in 2005 and is still performed today. Every quarter, all eight hospitals provide their operating room data records to a central database. We call it our nationwide central OR benchmark research database. I will not repeat that too much. An independent data management center administers this central database. This center provides professional expertise to facilitate the collection and processing of data records, as well as data reliability and integrity checks. The center calculates all key performance indicators by combining the actual, actual performed time records with the total amount of allocated OR session time. The performance of one OR day, which in the Netherlands is generally equal to eight hours of block time allocated to a specific surgical department, is evaluated by the indicator raw utilization. It is the total amount of time surgical patients are present in the OR divided by the amount of allocated block time per day. The time when there is no patient present in the OR or so-called non-operative time can be evaluated by three indicators. First case tardiness at the start of the day, turnover time between cases and empty time at the end of the day, also called idle time, if cases finish earlier than scheduled. If cases run longer than scheduled, this is indicated as overutilized time or short for overtime. To sum it up, the central database contained organizational characteristics, 
like the amount of surgical cases, case duration, and the type of case, and performance indicators, like the ones I just mentioned, on the OR departments of all eight university hospitals in the Netherlands. As I used to say, I was sitting on a gold mine of data. First, some organization character organizational characteristics. This figure shows the total number of surgical cases performed per university hospital per year. This includes elective as well as non-elective or emergency cases. It also includes inpatient cases and outpatient cases. So this is just all piled up. During two years, two hospitals were not able to provide data to, to the research database due to a tran transition to another hospital information, information system. So that is why you see the blanks. On an overall level, the eight hospitals together perform about 138,000 surgical cases per year, which is about 17,000 surgical cases per hospital per year. This figure demonstrates the ratio of inpatient elective and non-elective or emergency surgical cases per center, 75% versus 25% on average. Each year, this ratio is fairly constant the ratio does, does differ per hospital, reflecting the hospital catchment, catchment area. This table demonstrates the duration of total procedure time in minutes per surgical department, including all inpatient surgical cases, elective as well as emergency. Total procedure time is the sum of anesthesia induction time, surgeon control time, and anesthesia emergence time. It will not surprise you that cardiothoracic surgery and neurosurgery uh, are characterized by a longer duration than other departments. If we look at, at data per year, a trend can be seen that in all hospitals the duration of surgical proce procedures increases, which reflects the concentration of complex, highly specialized care within the university centers. Well, we experienced that our benchmarking collaborative had positive side effects in addition to the actual OR performance comparison and in addition to the benefits of performance improvement. We organized regular OR benchmark meetings, we call these the study meetings, and they were usually visited by 25 to 30 professionals originating from all eight university hospitals. These professionals represented OR management, anesthesiologists, surgeons, OR nurses, anesthesia nurses, and staff and policy staff advisors. These meetings helped to build a comprehensive and strong business network. Also, every year a nation, national conference was organized. The main goal of these meetings was to explore the story behind the data of each hospital and, to, and the story behind observed differences between hospitals. Even though the principal topic was focused on the utilization of OR time, these meetings also initiated discussions about a variety of subjects such as quality of care, patient safety, work, workforce, and management strategies in the, in the OR. So this was all knowledge that was shared between the centers. Well, back to the more tangible results. Benchmarking the OR performance in Dutch university centers resulted in improved OR scheduling, reduction of case cancellation, a reduction of first case tardiness, and improved utilization of limited OR time. How did we accomplish this? At first, we focused on utilization of OR time. The overall performance, uh, I, I already told you what the utilization of OR time is. Mm. So it's every time, uh, it's all the time a patient is in the OR. It is a measure for the use of staffed operating room time. This definition excludes turnover time and overtime at the end of the day. In the central OR benchmark database, utilization is also measured, including turnover time. However, we prefer to measure it uh, and evalu evaluate turnover time as a separate indicator. Because especially in a university hospital setting with large OR facilities and longer patient transport times, this can identify further areas for improvement. The differences in raw utilization, take a look at the median in this figure, uh, between the hospitals is not striking. And a higher utilization percentage is not always preferable. In many cases, a high utilization rate will go hand in hand with overtime at the end of the day. Overtime may result in staff overtime payments, employee dissatisfaction, as well as patient dissatisfaction in case of cancellations. So since differences in the utilization of OR time are not striking, Nevertheless, learning opportunities do exist. 
These opportunities mainly result from performance indicators measuring the OR time, which is not utilized. So it is common for OR management to spend effort in reducing first case tardiness. Because of the expected positive psychological effect on the OR team of starting on time throughout the whole day. Starting on time means less rush, which is one of the conditions leading to a safe working environment. In the box plot, you can see the amount of first case tardiness in minutes. The table shows the frequency of occurrence, which can be inter interpreted as a percentage of operating rooms starting too late on any given day. Well, combining the two, so the duration in minutes with the frequency of occurrence, you could say that the so-called academic 50 minutes still endures in the OR departments of the Dutch hospitals. On an overall level of all eight hospitals, 43% of all first surgical cases start at least five minutes too late, later than scheduled. Analyzing this data in our OR benchmark study meetings, urge the participants to explore interventions to improve the performance at the start of the day and to reduce this tardiness. Well, three hospitals decided to focus their specific efforts to reduce first case tardiness. A fourth hospital decided to focus on the implementation of a multidisciplinary preoperative team briefing in the holding area, not intentionally aiming at the reduction of tardiness, however, expecting this could be a beneficial side effect. During another study meeting, the interventions to be implemented were discussed and identified. In one of the centers, a specific, you, say, you can call it a police team, was assigned to provide feedback directly when OR started too late. So in person and on the spot every morning by walking around. Team members consisted of an OR coordinator, anesthesiologist, surgeon, an OR nurse, and an anesthesia nurse. So they provided directly feedback. Well, in another center, early in the morning deliberation on ICU availability caused delay for the first patient scheduled for major surgery requiring post-surgical ICU. With the help of a new agreement between the OR and ICU department, uh, the OR did not have to wait to start the procedure until an ICU bed was officially released. If there was no ICU capacity available, an extra uh, flex bed, temporary bed was created and the OR could start without delay. Another center uh, changed uh, the activities concerning, concerning the patient process. The OR nurse instead of the anesthesia nurse became responsible for the transport of, the, of, the, of a patient from the holding area to the operating room. Meanwhile, the anesthesia nurse could continue preparing the OR for surgery and anesthesia. Um, and as I told you, the multidisciplinary uh, preoperative team briefing uh, was implemented and it also had an effect on, the re on uh, tardiness. Well, we, uh, the results were published in the American Journal of Surgery. Well, the study showed that benchmarking can be applied to identify and measure the effectiveness of interventions to reduce first case tardiness in a hos university hospital in environment. The effectiveness of these improvements was not just measured with a simple before-after design, but with a more robust ANOVA with contrast analysis, which considers multiple time periods in, time, in a time series design, minimizing the extent of background variation in an always changing complex OR environment. Well, another eye-opener from the benchmark database was the large amount of underutilized time, so idle time or empty time at the end of the day, and at the same time, a large amount of overutilized time in other operating rooms at the end of the day, both indicating improvement opportunities for OR scheduling. Here you can see the box plot of early finish. A median of 50 minutes and a wide distribu distribution representing a lot of scattered data. In both tables, you can see that the percentage of, OR, of operating rooms being empty at the end of the day is, in almost every hospital, smaller than the percentage of ORs running late. While in the Netherlands, the, perceptions, the perception of physicians and OR personnel is that rooms are always running late. Well, overall, every hospital demonstrated a structural underestimation of total procedure time, which you can see in the histogram of the prediction error, which is the actual minus the predicted procedure time. This supports the idea that surgeons tend to underestimate the time needed 
to finish a procedure. And anesthesiologists are not always able to accurately predict the time needed for anesthesia. So this OR benchmark data made the participants curious to dive in deeper and take a look at especially the variation in anesthesia time. During a study meeting, the hospitals exchange, exchanged their OR scheduling methods. In Dutch university centers, approximately 25 to 30% of total procedure time consists of anesthesia control time. In the current prediction method, the surgeon's estimation of surgeon control time was based on an historical median per procedure and per surgeon of the last 10 same procedures. A fixed time, of t a fixed time period of 20 minutes for anesthesia time was added to the surgeon's prediction. Together, this provided the predicted total procedure time, which was used for OR scheduling. As we can see in these figures, representing the actual realized anesthesia induction and emergence time, participants started to wonder how realistic the scheduling met method actually was. So we analyzed total procedure time focused, fo focusing on the ratio between surgeon control time and anesthesia control time. The OR benchmark data showed a mean ratio more than three, indicating that surgeon control time was approxima approximately three times greater than anesthesia control time. Based on this knowledge, we predicted the anesthesia time needed and used the time for scheduling instead of the fixed time period of 20 minutes. One example is this is really no rocket science at all. It's a simple method. Let's say the predicted surgeon control time is 200 minutes. Uh, then the predicted anesthesia time is 200 uh, multiplied by 33% is 66 minutes. So the new prediction of total procedure time was just 200 plus 66 minutes, 266 instead of 220 in the old method. So we, we did this in theory and then we uh, here in the scatter plots of predicted time versus actual time, you can see the difference between the results of the two scheduling methods. So this is the old method and there's the new one. It shows that this new prediction method with a relative time frame for anesthesia, result, uh, for anesthesia results in less prediction errors. More accurate, accurate prediction rules lead to less overutilized OR time and will also reduce the number of case cancellations. Our study was published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, so I think you all read it, and so you probably all know it. It confirms that especially in university hospitals, anesthesia time is a considerable part of the total procedure time and is also subject to variability. So it deserves to be scheduled just as realistically as surgeon control time. One other, one university hospital in Amsterdam, the Academic Medical Center, took it even further in a realistically scheduling in, in realistically scheduling anesthesia time and developed a complete new system of scheduling based on predetermined time frames for anesthetic technique. Well, these time frames were based on historical data and the actual time needed for anesthesia induction and emergence. In total, seven so-called anesthesia scheduling packages were established. Also a specific package for children. Several options based on the quantity of anesthesia monitoring, uh, intubation, arterial line, central line, and the complexity of the patient were differentiated in time within each package. Well, you can see it here if you have a very sharp eyesight, but just kidding, you don't have to read this. Just, I'll just give you an idea. The time frame for spinal anesthesia with, with sedation is 15 minutes and the time frame for an awake fiber optic intubation with epidural anesthesia is 80 minutes. So during the preoperative anesthesia assessment, the anesthesiologist determines the package required and registers this package in the hospital information system. Surgeons use the same system for, the, for our scheduling and are thus aware of the time, time frame already scheduled for anesthesia. Additionally, the surgeon schedules his time needed for surgery, including positioning, positioning, skin preparation, and draping. We analyzed this intervention with a robust ANOVA with contrast analysis again, uh, and results showed a significant decrease in prediction errors of almost 10%. More remarkable was the significant reduction in the number of case can cancellations with more than 200 cases, a reduction of 20%. 
This figure shows the absolute number of cancellations for all different recorded reasons. From the data in this figure, it's apparent that the main reason for cancellation was due to a lack of available time on the OR schedule uh, at the end of the day. So due to overtime of the previous case or due to poor scheduling. This category is one you can influence with, with your OR schedule, as opposed to a cancellation because of a change in the medical condition of the surgical patients. You, you cannot prevent that very easily. The number of cancellations due to a lack of OR time reduced with more than 25%. Uh, it was 117 patients after the intervention. So thanks to more realistic prediction of anesthesia time. Additionally, unanticipated results derived from implementing this new method. Uh, these are beneficial side effects due to the information that came available earlier in the patient process, which allow for a smoother OR workflow. The required anesthesia package is assigned already during the pre-anesthesia assessment, and it is printed on the OR schedule. Now anesthesia no nurses know exactly which medical equipment and devices they ne need to be assembled and tested beforehand. Correspondingly, anesthesia residents know in advance in which operating room a complex anesthesia technique, like an awake fiber optic intubation, is scheduled so they can watch and learn. Moreover, in light of technical skills training, the registration of anesthesia packages supplements the clinical training portfolio of residents as well as staff. Well, a final unanticipated result was the observed improvement in communication between surgeons and anesthesiologists. Because it is now transparent how long anesthesia time will take before the start of every operating room session, surgeons started to take this into account with regard to the complete OR schedule. So nowadays, a patient with a scheduled epidural cath catheter <laughs> is placed second on the schedule instead of first, because anesthesia time will take approximately 60 minutes. Surgeons suggested to start with, ep with the epid epidural catheter placement of the second patient while the first patient is still in the OR, which is called parallel processing. Well, sharing details about OR scheduling methods during our benchmark study meetings made the Radboud University in Nijmegen, a hospital in the east of the Netherlands, redesign their complete scheduling process by professionalizing collaboration during the pre- and post-operative phase. I think uh, we can, uh, it's comparable to the method which is used in the, in the children's hospital right now. Before this redesign, the OR schedule was prepared by the surgeon in charge. The anesthesiologist approved the schedule the day before. Cancellations regularly, regularly occurred due to missing data, overutilization of time, and other causes. Well, Radboud redesigned their scheduling method by implementing so called cross functional scheduling teams. Let's call them the, the CFT. Every CFT is chaired by a dedicated anesthesiologist and further consists of a surgeon, a scheduler, one or, one or two OR nurses, an anesthesia nurse, a recovery room nurse, and a nurse from the ward, as well as the OR manager. This team meets once a week to discuss the OR schedule of the next week and to evaluate the OR performance of the previous week in terms of utilization, cancellations, and other factors interfering with the smooth planning. The team examines the complete OR program day by day and members inform their colleagues regarding all relevant issues needed for optimal planning and safety. So this, this team was given full mandate or authorization by the head of the Department of Operating Rooms and by the head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Surgery to make operational decisions and alterations regarding the schedule. The team is fully responsible for this preparation and continuity, continuity of the schedule in, for the upcoming week. Once the schedule of the next week has been accepted, no changes are allowed to, made, to make without the team knowing and approving. We evaluated the effect of this intervention on OR performance by means of a controlled design, considering the empirical data of six, uh, of six uh, centers without this specific intervention. To define a consistent data set, we included one and the same specific surgical department in all of these university hospitals. 
These departments uh, share the, the basic logistic challenges and have similar patient case mix with, same, with the same ratio for elective and emergency cases. Well, the figure you see here illustrates the difference in raw utilization between the Radboud Center and the control group per year and shows the gradual improvement in OR utilization in Radboud. The control group demonstrates a less obvious impro improvement compared to the Radboud Center if calculated over time. Well, the figure shows the box and whisker plots per year, uh, displaying the variation of raw utilization in Radboud and the other six centers. These plots validated to reduce variation in Radboud during the years. So the stepwise reduction of variation, a decrease in the interquartile range during the years, indicated, indicated an organizational learning effect, whereas an increase of raw utilization a uh, reduction of uncertainty and reliability in scheduling were a display of more efficient utilization of our capacity. Hence, not only a better performance in terms of utilization than the other centers, but also a progressive improvement of this performance over the years. So several other university hospitals learned from this Radboud team-based OR scheduling method by implementing a light version. Last but not least, I want to take you to the end of the OR day. In general, three indicators evaluate the performance at the end of the day. The end of the day balances between either empty OR time or overtime, along with the potential cancellations of elective surgical cases. In our benchmarking collaborative, a specific analysis was executed concerning the connection between these three indicators because of their presumable conflicting interests. The concept of the devil's triangle, a familiar concept in project management, could also apply in the OR department. According to this triangle, the three constraints in the corners are mutual dependent, and when one of the three constraints changes, the other two also have to change. The OR benchmark data shows more, uh, more empty OR time when the cancellation rate increased and overtime decreased. So here you can see that in the dark blue uh, the dark blue line, which is the general surgery department, and in the pink uh, line from the ENT surgery department. Overtime increased when cancellations and MTOR time are low, so when there's a zero policy for case cancellations. So you can see, you can see it here represented in the yellow line, representing the oral and maxillofacial surgery department. Again, these metrics and relations evaluate the effects of strategy and policy making in the OR. So to sum it up, benchmarking the OR performance in the Dutch University Hospitals resulted in improved OR scheduling, reduction in case cancellations, a reduction in first case tardiness, and improved utilization of limited OR time. A collaborative and long-term approach of benchmarking is essential. This is necessary to build and maintain trust between the participating hospitals and for the development of uniform data registration and definitions. This approach also creates the best conditions like a safe learning and non-judgmental environment for knowledge sharing and actually actual quality improvement in practice. Well, benchmarking can play an important role in the plan, do, check, act cycle, the Deming cycle, as you might all, all, all know, and be a driver for continuous improvement. But last lesson, be aware of people who do not, do not fully understand the abbreviation of PDCA. And uh, benchmarking provides an easy way to learn from others and to improve. It's really not rocket science, not rocket science. So maybe you can, to finish the presentation, watch this little video. I hope it works. I'm glad you can make it. Can I get you a drink? Yeah, something soft. I'm driving. Parking is an absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? I have to reverse into the tiniest of spaces. Still, I managed it. I mean, parking is not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> And I should know. <laughs> Why is that? Are you a doctor? Careful. Not a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery. The other is brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you guys do? I'm an accountant. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still, 
It's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I mean, brain surgery, believe me, is very complex. Are you an accountant too? Uh, no, I work for a charity. Oh, that's a very selfless job, isn't it? I really admire you. I don't think I could ever do what you do. <laughs> I say that because it's emotionally draining, not because it's hard. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> Which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. Lionel, here's your drink. Lionel's a brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, he mentioned it. <laughs> Oh, Jeff, they keep you late at the Space Centre. As always. Have you met Lionel? Uh, no, hello, Lionel. So, Jeff, how do you earn a crust? Uh, oh, I'm a scientist. I, I work mainly with rockets. It's, <laughs> it's um, pretty tough work. Um, what do you do? Why, I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery? <laughs> Oh, he's actually rocket science. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your attention, and I hope to meet you all again. And so, so and I was just, uh, I was wondering because when Dr. Kaiser he uh, announced the prizes of the of the lectures, they were all uh, neurosurgeons, and I was like, oh my god, I will be at the end though. So sorry for that. <laughs> It wasn't on rocket science, though. No, it's no rocket science. Any questions? <laughs> okay. I have a question, Lisa. Yeah. So, how do you um, uh, engage the people? A lot of this is numbers, mm -hmm. and then I, I try to work with these numbers, and I try to then explain it to the people, but when I started off, I had no clue what the numbers meant. And, and so mm -hmm. how do you translate the messages that you have presented yeah. to the people actually working in your and yeah. trying to engage them in, mm -hmm. in using these numbers? Yeah, do you, you have a strategy for that? Uh, definitely. You, um, what I uh, see in most hospitals that benchmarking is still a management tool and actually only managers look at these numbers. But my message to the management is, please go to the OR and talk to uh, the surgeons and the anesthesiologists so you know what issues they have and what their concerns are. And then you can help with data. So it's the other way around. So uh, really uh, go meet each other and not just send a report by email, but talk about it. So, uh, so you can show how much data uh, is available and how it can help uh, the process. So, and, and start with the physicians that are enthusiastic, uh, uh, from uh, personally uh, enthusiastic about this data and interested. You start with these champions, actually, and then it will come further, yeah. I kind of wanted to ask the same question about implementation of change because you had the thing at the end, please don't change anything, and I think that's a very common feeling we all have because we lack our processes because it makes our lives easy to some extent, right? But when you're doing quality improvement strategies, do you do one thing first, or do you try and do everything that you think will work? Because my thought would be if you impl implemented something like avoiding tardiness for first case, mm -hmm. and you get some kind of meaningful impact on the slate, then people will buy into the next process that you put in. How did you go about this? Was it a stepwise thing, or did you just go, just gonna do everything at once? Uh, no, it was really a stepwise uh, thing, uh, and also with quality improvement, uh, the um, yeah the message is to uh, keep it small and to try and to experiment, and so you can follow the effect of the uh, of the uh, intervention. So really uh, small and incremental, uh, and not and not like a big bang, but really uh, on the go. Yeah. I noticed that there is a, there's a lot of <clears throat> time and effort put in by lots of different people. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I can certainly see that happening in a system where they're in a university hospital where they're all employees mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Because one of the problems is that there's often conflicting interests and values. So when you have, show the triangle, right, mm -hmm. <clears throat> who decides which is the most important part yeah. because you're going to make a decision, but who gets to decide that? Yeah, we t that's a really interesting question. Thank you. We talked about this yesterday also with our management uh, here in uh, Winnipeg, um, because 
is, it's not always clear what the strategy is. So the, the, the manager can say, okay, we have zero policy for case cancellation because I want to keep my, uh, my employees happy because we don't, don't want any overtime. But the surgeon thinks something else because he wants to use his, his, uh, uh, the time that, that is allocated to him. So um, my message would be, please talk about that uh, because it's not clear. We, we do not, we, we all assume and you know about assumptions. <laughs> They're the mother of all eat. <laughs> but uh, so I think that's what we see a lot. We do not talk about what is the strategy. And the strategy can change. Because uh, uh, when, when you really when you see your, uh, that employee, employees are maybe almost burning out, you cannot say we have, uh, uh, sorry, but uh, uh, yeah, you will have to work late. So yeah, change over time and talk to that with your uh, internal clients, your, your, your surgeons and anesthesiologists. Yeah, definitely, because they are conflicting. Thank you for a great presentation. Obviously, there's a huge amount of work and resources that have got into this. So uh, I have two questions, one of which is, how did you get those resources? Where did they come from uh, at the beginning? Yeah. At, eventually, you get buy-in and everyone says, great, we're going to support mm -hmm. this. But at the beginning, someone's got to, to foot yeah. the bill. Definitely, yeah. So that was uh, the surgeon I mentioned in the beginning. He was really interested and thought, well, this is what we have to do. But it started off. Uh, fairly small because we, uh, he hired a student uh, who had to uh, do his uh, thesis for the, for the study. So uh, then th it's like a win-win, you know, so there's not a lot of money uh, put into it. Into it. Um, but when, um, uh, it is, so that was the in initiation, uh, initiation phase. Uh, but when it became bigger, um, he asked all the university hospitals, all the participants to, uh, yeah, to put in, to invest and uh, so I was, I was an employee of the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam because I had to be hired in one organization, but all the organizations paid for my salary. Uh, so that was, they all paid an amount uh, of money every year and we had a, a balance uh, and check. So uh, yeah, so, but, so if you divide it uh, by eight, it's not that much. <laughs> and then my second question is more of a psychological question. I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm a burn surgeon. And, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, my cases are different. They're all variable. I can't predict anything. How did you get past that sort of uh, wall that yeah. surgeons will have? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a, a wall uh, we had to accomplish. Uh, also in the beginning, first, uh, this data is not right, huh? so that, that discussion. And then, yeah, my, my uh, speciality is really uh, difficult to, uh, to schedule. Um, but I must say, the results I showed you was from uh, inpatient, uh, fairly elective cases. So, uh, so we started with cases that are, that are predictable, more predictable, I think, than your specialty. But then uh, still, I think uh, if you use the data, historical data, you can maybe find some trends or some, uh, uh, yeah, some helpful tools yeah, to schedule what is possible. But I think uh, uh, you, have to, you have to have another strategy in scheduling, different from uh, other specialties, yeah. There's differentiation, yeah, you cannot say this counts for the whole, for every uh, surgical department, so. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.